Hello, I'm Avin Jogia. And I'm Erin Westbrook. Welcome to RealWorks. Today we present three student-made films based on their lives at home. For many, home is a place of love and comfort, but for others, it can be far more complex. Filmmaker Dexter Dugard Jr. was placed in foster care at the age of five. With his parents and siblings always a sub right away, his true home became the New York City subway system. Everyone has that one thing that they're really interested in. For some, it's cars. For others, planes. For me, it's trains. For as long as I can remember, the New York City subway has fascinated me. From the smell to the look, the sounds relax me. Is that weird? Maybe. But who cares, right? DJ was born Tuesday, December 15th. 1992 at 11.42 in the morning. But when he came home, he was 10 days old, and that's his first train ride. From Maimonides Hospital on 50th Street, the B train, all the way to Coney Island. His first subway, his first ride. Like everybody else, they come home in the cab or in the car. He came home on the B train. <laughs> Every Christmas, he had a train set. It was irrelevant to ask DJ what he wanted for Christmas. That is true. You couldn't say, DJ, what you want for Christmas train set? At the train sets. It never lasts long. Well, he tried to keep it going, but little brother and sisters didn't try to hear that. When he was two years old, he used to be, Mommy or Daddy, train. We had to go in the closet, pull out all the tracks, build the whole track system, and put the train on for him. And we used to cut off the lights, because the train had the lights, and it went all the way around the house, and he would sit right in the middle and watch. But you can hear the train from our window, because we lived a couple of blocks from the, from the train station. A long block and a short block. And at night, that J train made a lot of noise. Here, yeah, Bill. Here, yeah, listen. Soon, the subway would play a much larger role in bridging the gap between us kids and our parents. You guys was taken away April 27th, two days before Chelsea's birthday. I'll never forget it. April 27th, 1998. I was on my way from jail. When I came home, y'all was gone. There was nothing. Nothing I could do. Most hurtful part of my life is when they was taken. And we had to go to this To go to that. You know, you gotta scare Getting taken from my parents, taken in a van crossing the Williamsburg Bridge, with the Twin Towers standing tall in the yellow sunset. Images are all that's left from that moment. I'm there, I'm there for y'all, always. Always. You know what I'm saying? Always. I'm there with my father never did. Be there. We went through this because of other people. Because 
Well, there's Puerto Rican and I'm black. And the people next door didn't like it. Let me tell you, I bent myself backwards. I did everything in my power to get my kids. Um, and because of their fault, I couldn't get them. Those are just two of the stories I've heard over the years about why we've entered foster care. Personally, I don't really believe most of them. Though my sister did validate one of those stories, which the end result, it's partially her fault and partially my mother's fault. To see my parents, we've had to take the five train to the A or the C. I remember the red exteriors of the five and looking out the front window as it flew down Lessington Avenue. Living in my second and third foster home, we didn't really use the subway that much as they both had cars. But it was during this time I began to learn the subway map. I hated when our weekend visits would end. I'd cry sometimes, going back to this woman's house, going back to fighting with my siblings on a daily basis, getting bullied at school. It hurt a lot. I was in foster care for 15 years, but during the first six, I was placed in four different homes. DJ was always sad. DJ was always sad. Never forget it. DJ was always sad and kids would always be crying. And... <sighs> Even in his pictures, he was always sad. Even in his pictures when he was little, he never smiled. My cousin took me and my brother in 2004. From that point on, I once again began to ride the subway. During junior high school, I would cut school to ride the subway. And during the seventh and eighth grades, I visited all but two stations on the system, 145th and 148th streets on the three. Why did I cut school to ride the subway? Well, why wouldn't I? You know, I had the means. School metro cars don't work on weekends. And frankly, the school really wasn't my thing back then. Eventually, I got Mac together. Oh my God, I went over there. Every time when they showed, when they called his name, DJ! Her and my best friend. Oh, that was right the right most nice biggest, most proudest day of my life to see at least one of my children to be the first one to get that piece of paper. You're doing your thing. Do what I was doing, but I didn't do. I didn't graduate high school. I didn't go to college. Doing what I didn't do, like I always said. Don't do what I did. Please don't do what I did. Do better. I believe the subway system was built to take me far in life, to give me something to really tie my life together. It was built to take me. I guess to where I want to be in life. We are here with Dexter Degar Jr. who uh, made the film This Is Connections and uh, this is the connection. This is where all the connections are made. This is the Smith Street 9th Street stop. And what made you want to make a film that linked your family and the subway system? Well, originally it was to make it about my life with the subway system. Mm -hmm. So it then went to my time in foster care. Mm -hmm. What you, do you feel it was hard interviewing your, your parents or anyone you know like that, or was it easier, do you think? I was actually surprised they were both so ready and willing to open up my, our lives right. to this. Because normally when they talk about it, they kind of censor out a lot of information. So you think it was actually, it was, you were mo it was more liberated, do you think, yeah. the conversation? Yeah, actually, because wow. I learned a couple of things that I didn't know before, Right. even with the details of which I did know. Yeah. But not to know they were linked together and happening on the same day I was taken from foster care. Yeah, it was therapeutic in a way, this film. Yeah. It's really cool. 
Is this your train? It's going yeah. right now? Yeah, actually, I'm taking a straight on out to Coney Island, so. So the F goes all the way to Coney Island? Yep. That's great. So I, can, I gotta take the F on the other side? Yeah, so. All right, catch your train, man. I'm gonna go to the other side. All right. 18-year-old Martin Vasquez has been on the move most of his life. His search for a sense of balance, even when the ground beneath his feet was constantly shifting, is the subject of his poetic short film, Action and Reflex. The thing I recorded last time that didn't, that didn't capture? I don't know, it's up on top. Okay. Change is a part of life. We all go through change. Whether it be moving to a new house, getting a new job, or something big that impacts us. Change is inevitable. It comes when we are least ready for it, or when we are most prepared. We react to this with our responses. Our responses is the action and reflex we take to change. I lived in a small apartment with my mom and brother. It was a small worn out apartment in uptown New York. The apartment consisted of two rooms, a small kitchen, and a bathroom. My mom worked all day, which caused me to take care of my brother. We lived there for almost a year, just the three of us. Siempre me sentí con mucha culpabilidad. Siempre me sentí mal. Me sentí mal por no tener el modo de darles la estabilidad que ustedes tenían y que perdimos en ese tiempo. Cada día, cada día, cuando nos fuimos, siempre me sentí mal. Siempre era como un tipo de, de depresión, pero no lo decía. Eventually, around July 2012, my mom couldn't continue paying the bills on herself anymore. This caused me, my brother, and my mom to move to Houston, Texas. There, we moved in with my aunt, uncle, and my cousin. En ese momento sí era la opción que tenía. No tenía, pienso que no tenía otra. No me gustaba, pero lo tenía que hacer. Ese tiempo creo que lo tuvimos que pasar porque uno aprende siempre de lo, de lo bueno y de lo, de lo feo. Yo creo que eso nos, ha, nos ayudó también para, nos ha hecho a personas más fuertes. At first it was strange being there, since I lived in New York almost all my life. I went from a city environment to a quiet suburban life. Moving there made me feel anxious, since I was going to start a new high school I never even visited before. In Texas, living with my aunt and uncle at first felt uncomfortable, but we adjusted. After almost a year, I got used to living in Texas. It began feeling like my home, but living there didn't last long. My mom felt that it was best for my education and that it was best for me to move back to New York. She told me this near the end of my ninth grade year. I once again felt anxious as the days passed till it would be summer. I knew I'd have to soon say my goodbyes to everyone. How did it feel like moving to Texas from New York? Um, Wait, can I get have more time with that question? Uh, I felt nervous because there was a chance that we might stay in Texas, but at the time we were just planning to go there for a party, but it turned out that we actually stayed there to just live there in a year. Knowing that my mom had money problems made me feel very bad for her, especially since all the things she's already she all the things she's already gone through and now she had more problems to deal with. 
I wish that we haven't ha I wish we didn't move a lot from Texas to New York because I wish that I could stay in one school for years and live in one house instead of knowing that we're probably going to move next year. Do you think moving has affected you? Um, I think moving has affected me because I've never really lived in a place that I could actually call home and know that we're going to stay there for for years and not move to another place. Do you think that now you could call this place your home? Um, I'm not 100% sure if we're going to stay here or if we're going to continue moving back to Texas or just move to another area in New York. As soon as June 2013 came, I packed my bags and took the first plane out to New York. I arrived and moved in with my older brother. My mom felt that it was best if I moved in with my brother. Between July and August, I readjusted to New York after being gone for almost a year. I felt alone since I wasn't with my little brother, mom, family, and even friends. I spent the whole summer wishing it would never end since I would have to start all over again as the new kid. I felt like I was living in a box. Nothing was changing. I would do the same thing every day. I would have the same mood every day. And it was like reliving the same day only with a different calendar date. I had to accept that where I was now is where I would have to be. Looking back at all the moving I went through, I learned a lot of different things. I realized that moving a lot at a young age was big of me to do, and I'm surprised I was able to go through it. I was able to meet different kinds of people from my time moving, which helps me more now, since I can relate to different types of people more. I realized that people change, and just because you go back to a place you once lived in, it doesn't mean that things will be the same. Nothing lasts forever. Even when you're at your peak at being in comfort and at peace, there will always be disruption which in some aspects is good for us because it teaches us lessons and influences us. For thousands of homeless families, New York shelter system is the only thing standing between them and a life on the streets. The stress and uncertainty of homelessness never leaves you. Filmmaker Julia Negron bravely documents her family's experience and her struggle to hold on to normalcy in temporary home. Today is January 6, 2013, and today is not a very good day. No. It's going to be a long night. Yeah, it's going to be a really long night. Really long freaking night. We just found out that we got kicked out of our shelter because of our freaking caseworker because she doesn't want to give us back the paper for us to sign back in for, so... She kicked us out for that. 
So now, we're waiting for some resources to get to path. Path is like a building that, you know, they put it, they, they put, put you in shelter. You have to with that damn tape, and I freaking have a spaz attack. Oh, somebody's coming And I really doubt that we're going to find, we're going to be put back in the shelter today, so we're probably going to be staying at a really ugly and dirty hotel tonight. How do you feel about that, Mom? Stress. 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 Do you see the lines in my eyes? Stress. Jossie? Tired. 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 You tired? You tired? You mad? You happy? You happy? Yeah? No. Um, living in the shelter for about like a year, going on two years now, um, has changed me as a person a lot, um, more than I wanted it to. Um, sometimes I do blame my mom for the that has happened over the past, like, months and, or year and a couple of months, going on two years, but at the same time, I have to realize that, you know, she made mistakes and everybody does, and... I can't just blame her for everything because it's not really all her fault. But a lot of it is, so, you know, it's just mixed feelings, I guess. Um, as a person, I think the shelter has made me more, like, responsible in a way. Because when I was younger, I always, like, threw my stuff around and, you know, not really cared about the little things I had. But now I, like, treasure everything that I have. Um, I don't like living in the shelter at all. But I know that I have to get over it. Because, like, maybe maybe one day soon that, you know, I won't be living here in the shelter anymore. That I'll just, like, you know, be living in an apartment and be stable and have a better life. I'm not saying good because I will never have a good life. I don't believe that for right now, but you know. I'm in school right now, as you can see. Um, I've been starting to feel kind of like depressed a little bit. Um, I don't know why, but I just do, I guess, in a way. But it's hard. I feel like crying sometimes. And then he was like, and then he was like, oh, I'm clear, and then told me that I said this. High school is hard, especially being the only like alternative girl here. Like you know, emo. I'm I'm the only one here. So a lot of things you know do happen when I'm at the shelter. Like it's very depressing, and I do go through a lot of stuff. But um. There are things that do hold me down and that, you know, make me feel better about myself. Um, like my baby sister, I totally love that little surprise. And I say surprise because we didn't know that she was in my mom's stomach until like four months or I think three after, you know, she was growing in there. Um, there is nothing I can't like, describe that will ever match any kind of word that will, you know, just tell you how much I really care about the little girl because I love her with my entire life. Like, I would give anything for her. And ultimately, she saved my life. And she's not even three yet. <laughs> it's almost your birthday, baby. And she got mad just now. You okay? You feel okay? You feel sad? Give it a kiss. It wants a kiss. Don't cry. Oh, don't cry. We got school tomorrow, right? Huh? We got school tomorrow, right? Why? Because school is important. Right? Right? Come on. I love this angel.
love you so much. Oh, I love you so much. I love, I love. Give me a kiss. Give me a kiss. Where's my kiss? I want to get a kiss. Mwah. I love you. Well, that's it for today's show. Thank you for joining us. See you next time on RealWorks.